Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. You have an enemy within you, and that enemy is called pride. Pride is very dangerous to our spiritual well-being, and failure to overcome pride will have disastrous outcomes both physically, spiritually, and perhaps eternally. We need to learn to walk not in pride, but in humility. And I want to give you two examples of this. Think for a moment about Moses. Moses is called repeatedly in the Scripture, the servant of God. I don't believe there's a better title than that to be known as the servant of God. And what else does the scripture say? It says that Moses was the most humble individual. And these two things go together in an inherent matter. If we are humble, we will serve God. If we are prideful, we are going to serve self. So let me ask you that question. Are you operating in pride or humility. The second example is, of course, our Lord and Savior, Messiah. When we look, for example, in Philippians chapter 2, Paul is speaking and he speaks about Messiah's humility. He says, Messiah, he humbled himself even to death on a cross. And because of humility that led him to obey God, what does the scripture say? The scripture says that God gave to him the name above all names, that the name of Yeshua, that is Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, and this is so important, to the glory of God, that he is Lord. Remember that. Humility leads us for God to lift us up, to raise us up, Pride, what does the scripture say? Pride goes before a fall. So again, if you were to evaluate yourself and the decisions that you make, the actions that you take, are they more rooted in pride, selfishness, what you are seeking, or are they more established by humility? There's no position in between. You are either living, submitting to the influence of pride or the influence of humility. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew chapter 18. Now, it's going to be clear here that Messiah is teaching about the dangers of pride and the power and the blessings that come from humility. Notice what he says in verse 1. Matthew chapter 18, verse 1, Yeshua says here, in that hour, now pay attention to that phrase, in that hour, what hour are we speaking about? Well, if you remember last week, in that previous chapter, Yeshua said something. He told his disciples that he was going to Jerusalem there he would be betrayed and delivered over to men, and men would put him to death. And at that hour, what were the thoughts of the disciples? Well, keep reading, going back to verse 1. And in that hour, the disciples, they came to Yeshua saying, Who therefore? is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, they ask that in regard to themselves. I mean, we know one thing. We know the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is God. 
Remember what we learned. God the Father said concerning Yeshua, the only begotten Son of God, that at your name, everyone is going to bow and confess to the glory of God. He's going to receive that name above all names. Yeshua, he is the greatest. But they were thinking about themselves. They heard that Yeshua was going to die, and they thought to themselves, well, now among us, who's going to be the greatest? And notice how Messiah responded. Now, he could have responded by scolding them, pointing out their wrong way of thinking, and by the way, pride always leads us to think incorrectly. Pride leads us away from the things of God, the purposes of God. And pride, the scripture says, pride goes before a fall. That is, pride leads us to be deceived by the enemy so that they can knock us down. God wants to empower us, strengthen us, position us in his will. Pride removes all of that. So Messiah's response is this. Look now to verse 2, and Yeshua calling to a small child. Now, the biblical word here that's translated a little child, a small child, has to do with a child who is very young, small in age. This word probably relates to a toddler, a child around two, perhaps three years of age. And such a child, many times when we see a child walking, he doesn't go too far before he he lifts up his arms in the direction of his father, his mother, so that they can pick him up. And it's not always because he's tired or she doesn't want to walk. It's because they need that reinforcement, being brought to intimacy with their parent. Likewise, when a a young child has a problem, that they need something, something that happens in their life that, that frightens them, that is unpleasant, what do they do? They seek out their parents. And what Messiah is saying is this, unless we learn to be dependent upon our Heavenly Father, listen to Him, recognize Him as the authority. See, small children, they... They listen to their parents. And what I mean by that is this, that they are told something, and more often than not, a small child will believe that. Now, I have an older brother. And when I was very young, he used to tell me ridiculous things, and I used to believe it. Sometimes those things would scare me. Sometimes those things would would be great pleasure for me. I thought, wow, this is going to happen. And of course, as an older brother, he's just just playing with, with his younger brother. But the point is, a little child tends to believe, accept, hear, and receive that. And that's what Messiah is saying. If we want to be, and here's the key, great in the kingdom of God, We need to be able to demonstrate as mature individuals that same dependence, that same recognition of authority that a small child does for his or her parents. So once again, verse 2, And Yeshua called to a small child, and he set him in the midst of them, that is, before these 12 disciples. Verse 3, And he said, Yeshua speaks to the disciples in a most humble way. He simply says, truly, I say to you, unless you, and this next word is so significant, the word turn. Now, it is one of the New Testament words that relate to repentance. But it's simply the word to turn. And it implies something. When you turn To God, there's going to be change in your life. See, pride thinks that we've got it all together, that we know how to act, just get out of my way and let me do what I want to do. 
But humility realizes that we're not perfect. Humility teaches us that we need change in our life. And humility, like a small child, they will turn not to some stranger, but a child will find security, comfort before his or her parent. And that's what Messiah is saying. We need to be individuals that turn towards God and doing so will bring what this word is about, about change, a godly change, a righteous change. So he says, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become as little children. Now, what he's speaking about here is a, some people call it a childlike faith, a simple faith. You tell a small child something, they don't go after all the details, they simply hear and they accept. And in that same way, we as adults, it is good for us to have a childlike faith. And what do I mean by that? Well, there is another uh, Bible teacher, more of a motivational speaker, and he was speaking about the love of Messiah. Now, we all know that song, Jesus loves me, this I know. Why? For the Bible tells me so. And this individual was kind of uh, uh, dealing with that song in a negative way. He's saying, here's the problem. If if we have a childlike faith, when, when that child gets older, for example, when he goes to college, his faith is going to be challenged. And when he starts hearing the things of science, that faith is going to be destroyed. No, it is not. True faith will never be destroyed. And here's what I want to say to you. We have seen historically that science has to catch up to the revelation of God's word. Let me give you an example of that. It used to be that the the most intelligent people thought that the earth was flat. But you can go to the book of Isaiah, and and nearly 3,000 years ago, more likely 2,750 years ago, Isaiah said that the world was round. He used a word that depicts a round earth, not a flat. So it was literally centuries later that the best scientists, they caught up to the prophecy of Isaiah and knew that the earth was round. And we see many examples of how the Bible says one thing, science questions that, scoff at that, but later on, we find that science confirms what the Bible said long ago. Everything in the scripture we can defend. There are no problems in the word of God, what the word of God says, it is in conflict with nothing that science has proven. We find that the word of God is indeed defensible. We can, if we study the word of God properly, we see that truly scripture is given by God, inspired by him. There is no errors whatsoever in the word of God. No, those who kind of look down upon a childlike faith, they have not read or they have not obeyed what this scripture is saying. Yeshua clearly says, let's move on. He says, unless you turn and become as small children, he says, you will not, and by the way, there's a double negative here. It's not as we think in English, a double negative makes it positive, not in Greek. A double negative emphasizes this this fact. When he says, and we can translate it, no, not, never, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. So we need to be people that trust God like a small child trusts their parents and rely upon them. Verse four, therefore, whoever humbles himself 
as this small child this one and it's emphatic this one is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven so he this is the son of god teaches us that we need to have humility and this humility produces dependence we need to have that humility that depends upon god again just like a small child depends upon his father or his mother this is what is pleasing to god and empowers us giving us access to the resources of the holy spirit to change us grow us mature us in obedience to the will of god now look at verse verse 5 and whoever should receive one of these small children or a small child and here's what he says in my name now literally it says upon my name which is teaching us a foundational principle and that is if we are humble we're going to have the character of messiah remember this simple truth when the bible speaks of name it's emphasizing character and it's when we have a concern when we look out for small children that we protect them shelter them love them educate them in the things of god that we just like he says here when we do so he says if you should receive one of this one of the small children in my name me you receive now notice that what he's saying is when he writes and me you receive receiving the character of messiah here's what spirituality teaches us when we accept the gospel the holy spirit and the holy spirit is the spirit of yeshua of the messiah of the christ his spirit comes to dwell within us and we begin to live out his life through our actions our words he becomes our life so it's this humility it's this this trusting it's this reliance upon god that that produces in us a change whereby we become in behavior in action in thought in word in everything we become more and more like messiah so when we receive one of these small children in his name for his purpose based upon his character we are he's saying me you are receiving now instead of being a positive influence that's what it means to receive one of these small children the possibility is that we can be a negative influence have a a poor testimony before them and this is what messiah is going to begin to speak about in verse 6 he reads but if if you shall be an offense and this word is a a stumbling block giving a bad impression being a negative influence so he says but if if one is a stumbling block to one of these little ones who have believed in me notice what he says now this scripture we don't hear a lot about but it it gives us a good indication of his character and how serious this issue is the scripture that we're studying is profoundly significant and we need to realize that by the terms the words that yeshua shares once again but but if you become a stumbling block an offense to one of these little ones who have believed in me he says middle of verse six it would be better for him this one who becomes a stumbling block it would be come better for him that he hangs a a heavy millstone around his throat and be sunk 
in the depths of the sea. Now, did you hear that? Pretty strong language. Yeshua says, if anyone becomes a stumbling block to one of these little ones that have believed in me, it would be better for him to hang a, a heavy millstone around his throat and to be sunk in the depths of the sea. Now, what is he saying here? He's saying that from his standpoint, from a kingdom perspective, it is worse to be a spiritually a negative influence on someone than to lose your life. He's emphasizing in this language the importance of the spiritual dimension how much he wants us to be a godly influence. And it's better to lose your life than to be a negative influence. Now, he's not suggesting here that we go and and kill ourselves because we've done something wrong, but he's emphasizing, he's teaching us a very important principle, that the spiritual is more important than one's physical well-being. Likewise, he goes on to say, look at verse 8. He uses the word woe. That is, unless there's a change, how awful something's going to be. And beginning in verse verse 7, he talks about the world. And when he speaks about the world, he's speaking to those who are committed to a worldly approach that, that emphasizes the things of the world instead of the things of the kingdom of God. So verse 7. Woe to the world. Why? Literally it says, from the offenses, those stumbling blocks. And what he means is this. Woe to the world. Why? Because from the world comes these offenses, these stumbling blocks, these things that produce a negative influence in in people. Then he says, last part of verse 7, for it is necessary for for these offenses to come and what he means is in this world it's a matter of fact offenses there's going to be stumbling blocks in this world why because this world is stained with sin so when we are operating in the world from its perspective its mindset pursuing the things of the world we are going to naturally be a stumbling block live behave in a way that's offensive to others spiritual well-being in other words we're not going to have a godly testimony so he simply writes here woe to the world meaning the things of this world and the character of this world because from the world comes these offenses it's natural that offenses come from the world but he says however Woe to the man, that man, through whom such offenses, such stumbling blocks should come. This is what's vital. Woe. Now, he uses this word twice. The first time in regard to the world, woe to the world. And secondly, to this one who behaves in a worldly way not trusting his heavenly father, not depending upon the truth of God. And he says, woe, and remember what that word means, how awful it will be. Verse verse 8. Now he's going to give an example, and it's vital that you hear what he says and what he does not say. Verse 8. But if your hand or your foot causes an offense or a stumbling block to you, what does he say? Cut them off. In the Texas Receptus, the King James will have it in the plural, cut them off. Some of the other Bibles will make it singular, cut it off. But the point here is get rid of it. But listen very carefully to this. We we might use our hand to commit a sin, to be a stumbling block, we might use our feet to go to a place where, where unrighteous things are done. So we may sin and be offensive, a stumbling block, with 
our hands and our feet, but they are not the cause. It's very important that we hear what he's saying. Now, a few weeks ago, Messiah taught this. He says, what defiles an individual is not what he puts into his body, but what comes out from his heart. And what he says, if your hands or your feet cause you to be an offense, cut it off. What he's telling us is get rid of the source of being an offense, a stumbling block. And what is that? It's not your hands or your feet, but it's your heart. We need a new heart. And in the Bible, there's a connection between the heart and the mind. We need to get rid of our mind, our way of thinking, and replace it with the mind of Christ. And that's why he says, cut it off, because it is better for you to enter into life crippled or lame than having both hands or both feet and entering into, that is to be cast into, eternal fire. Did you hear that? Eternal fire. Now, here again, people scoff at at hell, a, a fire damnation. But this is the words of Yeshua, the Son of God. And he says, it is better for you to rid your thing, rid your body of that thing which causes you to sin than it is to hold on to that and be complete physically, but be cast into eternal fire. Verse, verse 9. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and cast it from you. Why? Because it's better for you if There's one eye, and you enter into life, and life here is synonymous with the kingdom. Enter into life, then having both eyes, and here again, being cast into, and now he says, he writes, into hell fire. Now, notice he's speaking about hell, and twice when he says eternal fire and hell fire, notice fire is mentioned twice. It speaks of the reality of hell. And pride leads us into that experience, experiencing hell. It's only when we're humble and we trust the living God who sent his son into the world, then and only then will we enter into life. Well, I'll close with that. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Shalom from Israel.